Lonnie Sitake tomorrow at 8 Eastern on BYU TV. Next time on a Story Trek reunion episode. Years ago, I met a couple frustrated with America. I looked at her, I said, we're going to Australia. Pack your stuff. I catch up with them in their new home. Big T! <laughs> what are you doing? Plus, a former TV star and old friend who beat the odds to inspire thousands. My mom, three-time recovering drug addict, uh, single mom, moving us around house to house, home to home, job to job. Join me tomorrow on The Story Trek. You're watching BYU TV on KBYU DT Provo Salt Lake City. Hello once again, Cougar Nation. Welcome back inside the Coordinator's Corner. One final time this season. Brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. It's rivalry week and the Cougars heading into the Utah game off of back-to-back -back wins. A win back east at UMass followed by a home field dismantling of the New Mexico State Aggies. The Cougs at dominance on the ground, especially on the way to the win. On today's show, we're looking back and ahead with special teams coordinator Ed Lamb and defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki. Coach Lamb joining us in the first half hour. Coach Tuiaki joining us in the back half of the show. Glad to have you along with us on BYU TV, BYU Radio, Sirius XM 143 and 107.9 FM, along with ESPN 960 AM. We are also live and on demand at BYUtv.org, BYURadio.org, plus the BYU TV and the BYU Radio apps, and we invite your questions for the coaches using the hashtag CCBYU on Twitter. Good to have special teams coordinator, linebackers coach, and assistant head coach Ed Lamb with us to open today's show. Ed, good to see you again. Congratulations on the win. Thanks, Greg. Pretty comprehensive. 45-10 uh, the final score, uh, yet the start of the game, interestingly, was kind of reminiscent of the week before. A little shaky to start, great recovery. It, it was, yeah. We were, uh, I think everybody was really concerned, but the guys just uh, just kept playing hard. A couple of uh, adjustments uh, were made. We got a run game going on offense. That that was big and got things started really well. Had a couple of turnovers early in the game um, and, and got the offense rolling as well. And then uh, and then defensively, you know, just got uh, had to get a little more aggressive, play more man-to-man -man coverage. And and uh, the, the, we, we felt like that uh, their quarterback really played uh, one of his best games. A lot of credit to him for stepping up. And even late in the game, we started bringing more and more pressure. He was stepping up and delivering strikes. They, weren't, they didn't turn into scoring drives, but uh, credit to New Mexico State's quarterback. I want to head back to the beginning. And New Mexico State uh, took its opening drive, 13 plays for 85 yards and a touchdown. Kalani, late in that drive, calls a timeout for a little chat. Uh, he, did, he did, yeah. He, he was... Um, yeah, he he wanted to just make sure he he's done this before, and really a lot of games uh, when we've given up a long drive. I think that, yeah, did you say there was a thirteen play 13 drive? Plays, yeah. yeah, a lot of times he he'll say you know right after a long drive, gosh, I should have taken a timeout right there and let the guys rest. So I I think he did. He he wanted to to motivate them and let them know you know how important it was and and all of that. And he always brings great energy in those moments, and and that can certainly help. But uh, more than anything, allow the guys a chance to regroup. More more like a basketball timeout than a traditional football timeout where mm -hmm. you just are managing the clock. It was uh, just to regroup and talk about some changes. And it was the only touchdown drive allowed in the game. BYU has outscored the opposition in quarters two, three, and four. First quarters, for whatever reason, Ed, are a little different story. BYU's been outscored 69-38. to 38. It is a four-quarter game. But how do you look at uh, the first 15 minutes and what they do or don't mean in terms of an end result? You know, I, I don't have if, – if I had uh, the, the – um, the answer on on how to turn that around, then you know I would have stood on the table and made sure that we implemented it. But I know I, I have learned one thing um, that sometimes uh, sometimes with all the statistics in football, we just start mining for patterns. And one of the things that's really dangerous to a team is when a pattern develops early in the season, and then as coaches we try to address it, talk about it, correct it, hold them accountable, and pretty soon it's a it becomes a, a self fulfilling process, prophecy. There's just you know, in, in matchups with other teams, it uh, there there are certain patterns that develop, and it doesn't always mean that that there's a cause. But uh, I think as coaches, sometimes we you know all, all of a sudden we want to run into a game and start to start throwing the ball deep early in a game to try to get quick scores. And and there's no historical evidence or statistical evidence that uh, would say that that chucking the ball deep or blitzing or not blitzing or any of that stuff leads to a fast start. It's just uh, a fast start is a fast start. It's executing the game plan as is, whatever it is. So we want to address it. We want to hold them accountable. We want to start fast. We're disappointed. 
and uh, we'll, we'll keep trying to find ways to do that. But you don't want to make it the be all, uh, end all, and uh, be all of your of your team's existence right now. Yeah, yeah. We don't come in on a Monday and say, uh, "Hey guys, uh, first that was a again. really disappointing yeah. victory we had, and that is unacceptable." And we're the next time that happens, we're actually going to lose. Like that's not that's not how to to coach young men. I don't I don't think. Uh, two three and outs for the Cougars on offense to start. Third offensive drive with six plays and punts, so things kind of sluggish. But then. It's an INT by Malik Moore that turns the tide late in the opening quarter. Short field touchdown, and BYU is off and running from there. Big, uh, big play by Malik. Huge play by Malik. So, so happy for him, a true freshman, and and uh, has just worked his way more and more onto the field, special teams and defense. And uh, it was uh, originally that it was uh, tipped by Rhett Sandlin. Rhett, yeah, yeah, popped who, up in the air. Yeah, Rhett yeah. did a nice job in coverage on the play. Also, Shone uh, was the first look, and Shone was uh, in the early throwing window, and the and the uh, it was actually the tailback on the on the play that was the intended receiver, and he just kind of felt like he wasn't open, didn't get his header out in time, and so he didn't see the ball. Rhett made a break on the ball, and it bounced off a of Rhett and into Malik's hands. Now, Malik Moore is one of uh, multiple young DBs, and you know to that extent, what a bright future a future BYU has in the yeah. secondary right now. Uh, that's those are our, our San Diego boys right there. You got uh, D'Angelo Gunter, Malik Moore, Keenan Ellis, all from from San Diego. They're a great support group to each other. Um, D'Angelo goes by Mandel now, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, thanks for the correction on that. And then. Um, Isaiah Heron from Las Vegas, he he reached out to those other boys when they had signed. And so they're all very close. They're a support system for each other, and they're competing against each other. I don't know if you noticed in the game, but Keenan actually played a little more than yep. d this game, and uh, that competition is going to bring out the best in them. They're going to be very good for a long time. It takes more than one corner to man each side over the course of the year, so people shouldn't worry about, ah, oh, they're, all, they're all the same class. You need yeah. you need a bunch of guys. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the goal for us is, uh, and the objective for us, is to bring in four more next year and Four more the year after that. Yeah, absolutely. That When BYU's corners are good, BYU is good. And I feel like we're really trending in the right direction right now. And uh, fantastic for those young guys to fill in for Chris, who was really having a strong year and, and I believe will be a real leader for us next year, Chris Wilcox. And sometimes corners can turn into safeties too. So you're not necessarily locked in depending on how a guy develops and skills develop. They do. And, and actually, uh, you know, um, Malik has been playing the nickel yep. corner, which is a which is a safety position, and he's actually uh, most weeks he's meeting with the safe with Coach Hadley in the safety room because the, there's a little more carryover technically from uh, the way we play our nickel with the safeties than it is the corner position. So I mentioned the short field touchdown, and uh, that helps your average starting field position stats. Certainly, when you start at the 15 in the Satake era, BYU's now won 13 of its last 14 with the edge in average starting field position. It could be a one-yard edge or an eight-yard edge like uh, like Saturday, but any kind of advantage, generally uh, speaking, has been a pretty good win-loss indicator over the years. Yeah, that's that's a good, uh, a really good stat. It's a tough uh, stat to chase sometimes. In a um, game, you're not looking for that, but you, you can reflect on it. It yeah. can be, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough stat to, to coach, um, but yeah. it's a great stat to look back on and then figure out uh, ways where we could have been better in, in that way. And it usually comes down to uh, uh, offensive uh, play call management and, and turnovers, takeaways. Those are the two big ones on that. It, special teams breakdowns can be disastrous as far as average starting field position, too. And one, of the, and one of the great things about that stat is the fact that uh, all three components can say they have a hand in it. But they all they all go together in that. It is, yeah. There's a there's a, a few stats, you know, turnover margin, average starting field position, where all three components, where a head coach, for example, can look at the whole team and say, here's how we're contributing as the segments of the team or units of the team to this common goal. Against New Mexico State, to BYU did finish a plus eight yards in average starting field position since 2005. BYU is now 70 and nine. It's an 89% win rate when you get to five yards or more as an advantage in ASFP. Heading into the break on the coordinator's corner. When we come back, we continue with special teams coordinator Ed Lamb. If you have questions for the coach, please send them in using the hashtag CCBYU on Twitter. It is our season finale of the coordinator's corner. We're back with more from Coach Lamb right after this. Well, I did it again. Perfect dinner, weird toy for Kate. Even Nana's happy, and Nana hates everything. Oh, and I earned triple rewards while doing it? <laughs> Time to treat myself. Visa triple rewards from Mountain America on all purchases through December 31st. Don't worry, Dad. Mama's got rewards. Be a holiday hero with Visa triple rewards from Mountain America. Ten years ago, I visited Kenya to research a painting and was touched by the story of an orphan boy named Benson. Now, I'm back to tell his story in a brand new painting, 
and find out what this home means to him. My journey was so eye-opening last time that I'm eager to explore the tall grass again, where new inspirations for the painting lie in wait. Join me as I paint the town in Kenya. Blue runs deep on BYU TV. Watch BYU take on Rice live this Wednesday at 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain on BYU TV. Watch all of your favorite BYU teams on BYU TV, your home for Cougar sports. Countdown to kickoff, BYU at Utah, 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain, Saturday on BYU TV. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads. JCW's quality and a lot of it in Lehigh. American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman. BYU now back above 500 on the year. Bowl eligible at 6-5 and five and visiting Utah on Saturday night in Salt Lake City. And uh, Coach Ed Lamb, uh, the, the significance to you of uh, bowl eligibility for this program right now? Yeah, that's you caught me off guard with that question. It's it's all about uh, this week and and Utah, but it it was it was fantastic after the game to recognize and uh, congratulate the boys to of earning a bowl game. Uh, big deal for the seniors to not have this um, this upcoming game be their last game. There's different emotions on on you know each week leading up to as the countdown to your final game as a senior. And uh, it's just a, a fantastic feeling to know that we'll be spending the, the holidays uh, practicing and getting young guys more involved in the future and then playing a, playing another opponent. But the focus on uh, Game 13 can wait. Game 12 is uh, just around the corner. Uh, I want to talk about schedule a little, little bit and maybe how it's tough into this team this year. I thought you did what you needed to do against teams with maybe similar, maybe defensive profiles. Uh, Hawaii, UMass, uh, New Mexico State all kind of looked the same in a lot of ways, and BYU did very well against those three just to pick three out. Uh, and, and beyond that, there were games that really challenged this team. Uh, BYU's played one of the tougher schedules in the country in terms of who's won and lost games. Do you think that when you play a game like this late in the year that you've seen everything you could possibly see to prepare you for a team like Utah, a very good team? Um, yeah, I think I think yes. Yeah, somewhat earlier in the season, there would be as far as uh, uh, formationally and uh, the types of defenses, coverages. You know, just looking at it from a whole team perspective, that uh, that you see uh, what you need to see. And there's not a reason at this point to be putting in a lot of new offensive plays, defensive plays, you know, special teams uh, strategies. At this point, it's just it's just about fundamentals and technique and motivation and momentum. And uh, I feel really good uh, about where we're at right now going into this game. I know our, our boys are hungry for it. They're going to play hard, and it's going to be a fun game. The last time BYU uh, won the rivalry game comfortably was back in 1996 when uh, it was all it was ground game. Uh, it was a heavy ground game that day for BYU. And uh, this past week, uh, New Mexico State, 317 rush yards. You're not going to lose at 300, uh, generally speaking. We talked about Davidson losing to San Diego at about 800 rushing yeah. yards. But that said, BYU had six rushing touchdowns. And uh, since the uh, since 1972, uh, BYU is now 26 and 0 when they get to 300. So good number to shoot for, but uh, really good on the ground this past weekend. Uh, it sure was, and and we need that. You know, our, our players have a lot of respect for for Utah and uh, and what they do in, in rush defense and uh, in def defense overall. And so to get find a little bit of momentum there and find some confidence is going to be really critical going into this week of preparation. It'll be critical for our coaching staff, critical for our players. And uh, there's just yeah, there's just no. Uh, Nobody consistently winning in the game of football without uh, without having a rushing attack, whether it's used in every game is you know that's a that's a decision for offensive coordinators and and uh, the flow of the game, but uh, it certainly needs to be a threat, and I'm glad that it, our, our rushing attack is growing. One of the great things about having you on is your assistant head coach role. You kind of have a general oversight. And, and while BYU missed Squally this past weekend, three running backs ran well uh, in Lopini, Katoa, Matt Hadley, and Riley Bird as well. 
Sure, and that comes from uh, you know, in, in credit, uh, you know, Squally deserves some credit for that. There's always, amongst the team, when a good player is not available, there's always a tendency for uh, other guys to feel that pressure in a good way and rise to the occasion. And it's one of the exciting things about being a, a fan or a coach and being involved with the team is seeing the the guys of the future or the young guys. Or in, in Matt Hadley's case, a, a senior just get a few more carries, and he's he's really delivered all season long. He's such a well-rounded back and. Um, and then see Lopini and uh, Riley Burt get in there. Riley Riley Burt, I thought, had his best game, ran his hardest, and was really finishing through on, with contact. A fantastic uh, game for those guys. Uh, maybe I would have to infer that Lopini hasn't been maybe full speed all year, uh, maybe some ups and downs health-wise, but a resurgence for him, it appears, at the right time, hopefully, for you guys. Yeah, I thought, uh, you know, with, with football, a lot of times it's a, a nagging injury that might not be worth reporting about, and I think that's kind of what has held him back. But it's really about uh, playing with confidence, and I saw confidence come back to Lopini, and I saw him play like, well, what, probably his best game. When you had Matt Hadley on the defensive side of the ball, uh, could you have foreseen how good he'd be as a running back? We know that he was a prolific high school back, but it had been, it had been a while. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. I have, I have been, uh, you know, I, it, it's, that's a difficult move. He moved from starting uh, linebacker to running back. And so, it, yeah, I had a, a strong voice in making sure that he got an opportunity. I, I, he was uh, at running back during uh, practice a lot uh, last season and just never quite got the call in the game. I've always had great respect for his, his vision at the running back position. He's well-rounded. He's, he's tough as they come. He steps up in pass protection. He catches the ball on pass routes. He can get yards after the catch. And he's just an elusive runner you know, in a way that's really difficult. He, we would... Uh, you know, we we don't mind our defense. Uh, we don't mind facing guys that run really hard and fast downhill. We don't mind facing speed guys, but guys that can make people miss. Mm. That's a tough matchup, and Matt makes people miss. I've been really proud of what he's offered to the team. He's just been a selfless player. Started at four different positions in his career in every special team. Special teams notes now. Uh, ESPN has a, a special teams breakdown relative to efficiency ratings, and BYU right now is tied third nationally in that category. Yeah, uh, yeah. The the um, special teams efficiency it's a it's a cumulative ranking, which is pretty cool, and it's something that we we do share with our players and make sure they know. And sometimes uh, because special teams is so segmented, it's easy to look at one or two phases and say, well, this phase is really good and this phase is really bad. The efficiency rating is kind of a cumulative rating, and and what's really cool is it's uh, it's an acknowledgement of the fact that we like BYU special teams are we kick off better than our opponents we return kickoffs better than our opponents we return punts better than our opponents our national ranking in the return games has been a real disappointment for me and i i I need to do a better job want to do a better job keep trying different things but our our coverage units have been so strong that our that our overall average and overall special teams ranking as a core has been fantastic and then the the way that the boys get after uh, field goals kairostonga meti uh, the Kalfusi brothers up the middle with their length, and, and it's usually Mike Shelton off the edge. They really make it hard on opposing field goal kickers. So on that note, uh, teams have tried 17 field goals against you, have made six. So the field goal percentage against is second best to only Texas A&M. And this isn't like um, ne- missing free throws necessarily. This is the, There's something happening that's causing teams to miss more than, than the national average. What would you say goes into the number of six for 17 against right now? Well, um, some of that's just like I was talking about earlier, positive and negative. When you look kind of mine for data and stats, it can be it can be just the cause and effect of chance. But uh, but, you know, the coaching business is a small world. And typically I know and talk to before and after every game, the, the opposing special teams coach and um, the way that our guys uh, on defense get after uh, field goal block, the field goal block uh, techniques is something that uh, opposing kickers are really conscientious of, and they're trying to increase their op- decrease their operation tr- time. They're trying to get more height on the ball, and that's a really not a good place for a kicker to be is thinking about those things. So six for 17, not a fluke? Yeah, not a, not a fluke. It's it's hard to – I mean, we, we haven't had – um, 11 blocks, you know, but we right. do, we do, we are amongst the top in the country in blocks, and so that's something that's on the mind of uh, any any field goal kicker that has to face our our guys. More on Saturday's special teams day for a quick second before the break. Uh, Skylar Southam perfect again on his PATs. Uh, one field goal make at the end of the half when you guys called timeouts to get the ball back to score, and you did. Yeah, I thought that was a great uh, great decision by uh, Kalani to, to try to get the opponent to to go off sides and just to finish that half strong with momentum. I mean, I, I don't that was three scores in the last uh, four or five minutes there. I think uh, with clock management, defensive stops, and offensive efficiency, and so 
the, the the conversation there, I, I did hear the boos on the decision not to uh, shoot for a touchdown there. And when the field goal team came out, there were some boos coming from the crowd. And and I I understand that's what being a fan's about, you know. And we we feel the same as coaches and players, like yeah, let's go for the touchdown. But the reality is, uh, no reason to go into halftime there with um, you know not executing of whatever it would have been a 17 yard offensive play for a touchdown and kind of a downer on momentum. I thought it was fantastic with, for a game to start out the way it did. Uh, and then build a halftime lead of 31 to 7 that was huge it capped off a 24 point quarter which became the highest scoring quarter against an fbs opponent for byu in more than five years all right coming up next more with byu special teams coordinator ed lamb and your questions for coach lamb using hashtag cc byu this is the coordinator's corner our season finale brought to you by jcw's the burger boys back with more right after this no matter what stage you're at in life you're always looking to take the next step forward. At Deseret First Credit Union, we want to take each and every next step with you. With low auto loan rates, you can be ready to see what's around every new corner and amazing rates on home mortgages, so you can move up to something you've always dreamed of. Deseret First Credit Union, with you every financial step of the way. Membership and eligibility required. Equal housing lender. Game on. How'd you do that? My name's Eric Leclerc, and I'm a magician. And what does a magician do? Tricks. Check it out, it'll be awesome. Don't step on the beads! I put hidden cameras in everyday places to see how regular people react. What is going on? Real people, real reactions. What? Cameras in the van? Everyone I meet has been totally tricked. I'm singing any song, it's like... We are here at the Motion Picture Studio. I gotta go meet Dave. How are you, Will? Doing well, Dave. Thank you so much for helping out with this. Three cheers for these fine people! Hip, hip! Can somebody help me? I'm a little bit over here. Can anybody help me? We have a pretty tight time frame. I think we can pull it off. That's what I like to hear. My name is Emily. I'm a host on a TV show called Random Acts. Being sneaky is the best. My job here is done. It's a tough job, but somebody has to do it, ladies and gentlemen. Tomorrow on the season finale of BYU football with Kalani Sitake, the coach recaps senior night against New Mexico State and previews the rivalry showdown with Utah. Watch BYU football with Kalani Sitake tomorrow at 8 Eastern on BYU TV. You are in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys, BYU at Utah this Saturday. Just chatting off the air a little bit with Coach Lamb. This particular note of the last 20 meetings between these two teams, 17 have been decided by one score. Uh, that is as uh, intense a competitive rivalry uh, between true rivals that you're going to see in this country, Coach. It is, yeah. That's a, it's an amazing rivalry. I, I remember it as a player, and it really started to heat up during my time as a player. Utah, I think, it had elevated their program, and I think in the time, my impression anyway as a player was that prior to my my time as a player, that uh, Utah wasn't wasn't super competitive for a number of years through the maybe through the '80s or something with BYU. But uh, in the '90s, it heated up, and uh, and that was it was it was great fun to have that rivalry and and that that part of the game. And then I'm I'm just I've been glad that we've been able to play that in my years here as a coach and they've been close games and it's time for us to make sure to put together all the pieces to be on the right side of the scoreboard in a close game so i mentioned the 20 meetings the last 20 and that goes back to 1997 so from 97 to now uh, 20 games 17 decided by one score the three that got away went in utah's favor the last one to get away in byu's favor was that 1996 game yeah. in which uh, you took part up in salt lake city yeah, that was that was fantastic. It was just a, a a blowout from start to finish, and so anytime that happens, you know, the game was never in doubt really after the early in the game, and uh, so on the sideline we were having a lot of fun, and I think uh, you know obviously their team wasn't, and they they were just not able to get anything going against our defense, and they were not able to stop our offense, and so they, both both units were working so well together. What's the proper amount of weight or attention to give to the current streak that Utah has going against BYU? 
Uh, I think it speaks for itself. Um, you know, C- Coach Sitaka will address the boys this afternoon. I don't. Uh, he doesn't always uh, run by me what his overall message will be, but uh, and sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. But uh, I'm sure I'm sure he'll uh, recognize it and uh, not. You know, we don't want to. We don't want that to be our whole motivation. This is a different team. This is not last year's team. In fact, uh, you know, we, the fact that you mentioned that it's been close. I mean, I don't. I think right now maybe a lot of. A lot of young guys or fans are thinking, well, geez, it'd be great if it were close. You know, I mean, they're such a favorite right now. What we need to be prepared for is every situation, winning the close ones if it's close, but realizing it doesn't have to be close. And we play our best game and let the scoreboard speak for itself. Your early week impressions of the Utes? Oh, they're... uh They've they've done a, a fantastic job of fighting through injury with their with their offense, and uh, I think their their offense has just really found their rhythm, found their stride, found their identity. Their early games, um, what they were doing on offense, doesn't in in any way reflect what they're doing now. Uh, they did carry some consistency through uh, even the injury to the quarterback and their and their running back, and so they're they're in a groove right now. They know what they're doing. They do it well. They their offensive identity matches their defensive identity, which is tough. Uh, ball control. Um, take some shots down the field, let them get the ball in their playmakers' hands, and really, um, you know, see if they can win the game on defense and special teams. And they've they've really got a nice, you know, synergy right now between the three units: offense, defense, and special teams. As coordinator, you can appreciate their great special teams. They've had nationally prominent uh, place kickers and punters now going back a number of seasons. Oh, they, they yeah, they are. They're really really impressive to watch. Uh, Field goal kicker, he just hardly ever misses, and he seems to have range from anywhere on the field. And uh, punter, the, the same way, can get him. They, they can be pinned at their own end of the field, and he can completely flip the field with with one kick. Utah place kicker Matt Gay now has seven career 50 yarders. He's had one in each of the last two weeks, giving him now six and seven. There's probably some popular belief out there that uh, Matt Gay might have been or could have been a Cougar at some point. Anything you can say about uh, what that uh, real relationship was? Yeah, I've been I've been asked about that casually on the on the street in the grocery store. There's uh, yeah, there, there's no I guess there's kind of a, a legend that he tried out for the team here. There are no tryouts in in Division One football. It's not it's not allowed except for enrolled students. And to my knowledge, he's never been a enrolled student here. I've never met him. He's never tried out or met anyone on our staff or expressed an interest to be here. And and to my knowledge, he was not a field goal kicker until he arrived at Utah and enrolled as a student and then participated in a legal tryout. And, uh, in fact, you know, I mean, he's done a, from that perspective, it's an amazing story. Yeah. He's a fantastic kicker and, and, uh, have, we have a lot of respect for him. I know you like your guy, Skylar Southam, and he's been, uh, for a, fr- for a freshman, uh, pretty darn good for you. He, yeah, he, Skylar's, Skylar's really, uh, his personality is, is so tough and, uh, to have a tough minded kicker is, is, is critical. And so uh, he'll grow, he will improve. He's young, like a lot of our freshmen playing key roles all over the team. But, um, I'm, I'm so pleased with his approach and toughness and I enjoy coaching him. And that to me just gives me great hope for the, for the way that he'll have, uh, you know, throughout his career. And then three more years after this, he's got a great start right now and, and been very effective for us and he'll get even better. Okay, social media for Coach Lamb, at TMills34Jazz, says turnovers have played a major role in games against Utah. Uh, why is BYU tended to turn the ball over so much against the Utes, and how can BYU play cleaner on Saturday? Well, I think um, we, we have to make sure and, and know our identity going in. I felt like uh, at least the, the couple of years that I've been involved with it, I felt like the way we were searching for identity during the game, and that uh, mm-hmm. that can oftentimes lead to turnovers. And also uh, uh, playing from behind can lead to, to turnovers as the offense just tries to get something going. You know, Utah is very comfortable playing a low-scoring game, and uh, – and that's what I mean when I when I say they've got great synergy going on between their three units right now. Uh, we need to make sure that it, we don't we don't have to go in planning for it to be a low scoring game, but we have to know who we are. We have to develop that this week. We have to have a game plan that we're convicted in, and we need to stick with it for four quarters. Uh, there are adjustments every week, and there are adjustments during the game, but it can't be adjustments to our identity. Uh, the adjustments need to be built in and ready to go with all the contingencies forethought. And regarding identity, not coincidentally, uh, the two preceding games with, with which you've been involved as a coach came early in the year. Uh, there's no doubts about who you are here in the final game of the regular season. Yeah, I, I, I think we, we know. I think we know what we're doing well. The, the quarterback change, um, you know, and, and certainly the injury to Squally has been, uh, you know, some there have been some minor tweaks necessarily over the past few weeks. But I think our, our offensive staff is just every week. Uh, really growing in their knowledge of who our players are, who our playmakers are, and, and what our strike zone is in terms of how we attack an opponent.
Well, uh, Coach, uh, you're always uh, super insightful, and uh, I very much appreciate your contributions week in, week out on the show. Great spending another season with you on the Coordinator's Corner, and best of luck against the Utes on Saturday night. Thanks, Greg. All right, that's Coach Ed Lamb. Coming up after, after the break, we'll be joined by BYU defensive coordinator and defensive line coach Eli Satuyaki as we continue on the Coordinator's Corner season finale. Brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys here on BYU TV, BYU Radio, and ESPN 960. They prefer to be bringing the heat, getting set for success, demonstrating their drive. But when their blood and sweat turns to tears or anything else, we lay the groundwork for BYU's athletes to hit the ground running again, and you as well. Intermountain Healthcare, official medical provider for BYU Athletics. AAA agents like Leticia are popping up where people are having doubts about insurance. Like when it comes time to buy a car. So how can I help you today? What if I decide to become a rideshare driver? If you want to outsmart insurance doubt, visit a AAA branch. AAA agents like Octavia are popping up where people are having doubts about insurance. Like here, where Makai is learning to drive. What brings you in today? When I get my car, can my friends drive it as well? If you want to outsmart insurance doubt, visit a AAA branch. Okay, so who are we gonna prank? My grade 11 art class. We could take your whole art class to an art gallery somewhere and, and prank them there. It's just gonna go. Ah! What did you guys do? you know what? miss out on all the fun here on BYU TV. Tonight, contestants fight their way through a wet and wacky obstacle course on Splat-A-Lot. Watch an all-new episode at 7.30 Mountain. Then, live tomorrow at 6 Mountain, catch up with BYU head coach Kalani Satake and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel, as they discuss the ins and outs of your favorite football team. Watch your favorite BYU TV shows here and catch up anytime on BYUtv.org or the BYU TV app. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality, and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman. Second half hour, the Coordinator's Corner, underway now from Studio 3 here on BYU TV, BYU Radio, ESPN 960. As we bring in defensive coordinator, defensive line coach, Elisa Tuiaki, you can submit your questions for Coach Tuiaki using hashtag CCBYU. Coach, good to see you. Congrats on the W on Saturday. Thanks, appreciate it. Good to be back. Uh, BYU's defense continues to play very, very well uh, at this point in the season. And what kind of a groove are you guys right now? I think the boys are playing well, um, playing confidently on def- on the defensive side, and um, it's good to good to string together some good performances on defense and just kind of get guys um, understanding and playing their role and and uh, taking pride. And I think that it's uh, they're all they're all clicking together right now. You played 11 games. You've held the opponents to fewer than 24 points nine times in 11. You'll take that on the whole, won't you? Oh yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's a good stat to have, and and, uh, and credit to the players and the way that they execute the game plan. And, you know, coaches do a good job just putting it together. But it's uh, we're excited about that. The season's not been without hurdles relative to defensive personnel and losing guys, and you lost another one uh, for the season, unfortunately, in in Corbin Kofusi. Didn't find out about it really till closer to game time, and it was kind of a blow for fans. Like, oh man, how do you lose somebody this good at this time of the year? What happened to Corbin, and uh, what's his outlook for uh, the next level? Yeah, he had uh, he ended up getting banged up in the UMass game, um, but just he played through it actually, and and uh, you know when we came back and and uh, he just thought it was just a high ankle sprain and and uh, practiced a little bit earlier in the week, and then I decided to pull him for a day, and when he came back and practiced again, I just didn't, didn't feel like he looked right, and so I told him that we wanted to sit him this game and get him back healthy for the Utah game, and then it wasn't until you know the day before where they came back and just said, hey, we've actually found out that it's a little bit worse than we thought, and. And uh, you know he's he's got some stuff that's that's uh, banged up, and so you know that's that's a bummer for him, a bummer for the for the team. He's been playing so well and worked so hard in the off season. It was sad to see that happen. Now you try and get him right so that he can uh, have maybe a combine and and and, and uh, take it to the next step. Then yeah, right? yeah, it sounds sounds like he's going to have to have surgery, and the sooner he can do it, the better. 
um, you know, and so we'll just uh, we'll just hope for the best with him, just getting back on time and, and being ready to, to come perform in the combine. You replaced a one Kafusi with another. You'd put little brother Devin at a defensive end on Saturday night. <laughs> it was good. You know, we we're uns- unsure about uh, there were three guys competing for that spot, and I thought that they all did a really good job. Um, you know, uh, Uriah Leotal was probably the one that came out on top as far as just his performance in the game. But Devin came in and, and certainly played played his butt off and did well. Uriah had a sack in the game, as I recall. Did he? I think he did. I think I'm he got think in. I think he yeah. got in and got somebody. He, yeah. he, did, he did a really good job. Yeah. I thought that he was disruptive and played well. Uh, no Riggs Powell uh, this past weekend either. He's been playing well for you. Uh, can you get back uh, for Utah? We'll, we'll have to see about him. You know, he he didn't suit up for the game. Um, and uh, he's, he's still kind of limping around, so mm. we'll have to see. And he's got a bum knee. Wow. Well, you, you want to be uh, as... as, uh, as as full go as you possibly can for this kind of game, but you're not necessarily. But it's all a matter of uh, who's going to be uh, ready for the task and stepping up uh, behind the guys you're going to miss, right? Yep, yep, absolutely. It's, you know, there's, unfortunately you're not able to put asterisks next to uh, wins and losses, you know, depending on who you're playing, and nobody really cares at the end of the day. And come next year, no one's going to remember who was hurt and who wasn't. And so we've got to prepare the next guys up, and the next guys are got to rise to the occasion and, and uh, show up on game day. And, We'll have a good game plan in, and we'll be we'll be ready to play. Credit to Utah; they've lost a starting quarterback and starting running back, and they've just kind of kept rolling. Yeah, yeah, and those two that have come in done a really really good job, and they're both good players. Back to New Mexico State game for a second. BYU wins it to forty five ten. You allow only one touchdown drive, and it came on the first their off first offensive drive of the game. They went thirteen plays, eighty five yards for the score, and it was late in that drive that Kalani called timeout, and both you and Kalani had some words with the guys. What was important to be said at that particular juncture in the middle of that first drive? Uh, I think it was on the second drive. Was it I think second? we had a, fir- a three and out first, and then they came out on the second drive. And and uh, really, w- in that drive, there were a couple of things that uh, um, a couple of things that happened that that just you know we had a guy coming off the edge free that missed the sack. Um, we had a penalty um, that ended up moving the ball up a little bit, and then the, just the defense that we were in that we were planning to play a lot of during that during that day. Um, just wasn't as good, and so we just made an adjustment, talked to the players about just being sound, um, you know, doing their job, making their tackles, and, and uh, you know, they, they came out and, and uh, put a double move on one of our corners playing man-to-man, just did a really good job, and it was a well-thrown ball, well catch. Well, well catch, yeah, well, uh, well catch the ball. Um, but, uh, you know, just after the adjustments and just kind of getting guys to settle down a little bit, and, and really us defensively as coaches kind of, you know, we went back and looked at it, obviously after the game and felt like um you know what we were willing to give up and what we were what we were willing to play um in that series where we ended up giving it up just just ended up giving up exactly what it was it was just the miss sack the penalty um you know just the bad technique that ended up giving up that drive but once the kids settled in it was good and it was drive two. Uh, Coach Tuiaki, of course, is correct. Uh, three plays and four yards on their first series, then got it back, got their own 15, drove the 85 yards for the touchdown. How much of that timeout we just talked about was tactics, and how much was just getting in, making sure guys were awake <laughs> at that point? Um, it, it, I think it was a little bit of both. You know, sometimes you start to get in a little pan. You know, you get into a panic um, as a player. You feel like you're getting driven on, and and really, um, you know, it was just. It was just uh, getting them to settle down, um, getting them to do their job, getting them to play hard. And, I mean, it's one that they weren't playing hard, but it's just really um, calling the timeout, I think, was a great call by Kalani just to talk to the players. They ended up scoring anyways just on an, uh, on, a, on an excellent play. But then for the future and just moving forward, it was good for us to talk as a, as a staff on the headset about, okay, this is what we gave up. This is where we, you know, opportunities that we, that we missed. This is what we like. This is what we don't like anymore. And the quarterback was a better thrower than I thought he would be. I thought that we'd be able to sit in one coverage um, a little bit more than we did. Um, but uh, you know, we ended up changing it up, and the, and the players responded, and it was good. Now uh, their QB put it up 61 times on Saturday yeah. night. <laughs> yeah, uh, statistically, when we looked at it, I mean, it is. Um, I'm trying to think back for these last three years. It's one of the better, if not the best, um, uh, just pass defense that we played. As far as just you know, we all, we you know, we don't really talk sacks much. I mean, obviously those are important. PBUs are important, but it's um, yards per attempt. You know, if you're playing yards per attempt, five yards per attempt, that's like really, really right. good defense. And we were 4.3 per attempt, and that's lights out defense. Pass, you know, in the past game. When you look at it, you're like, okay, we gave up 260 something. But uh, I mean, for us, the number of times it was in the air, and number of times yeah. it was in the air, and, and what we ended up getting. I mean, we ended up with five sacks, two picks, 
and 4.3 per attempt. That's like lights out defense, and we're really, really happy about that. And BYU's pass efficiency defense number uh, nationally is uh, sitting in the top 35 right now. Uh, BYU's played very well that way. Right before the break, uh, quickly, Diane Gumwillick, who was your leading tackler on Saturday night, six tackles, all of them solo. I had a fumble forced on special teams like he always does. He's playing really well for you. Diane's a phenomenal player, and, and uh, when he's playing well, you know, a lot of things th- things happen for us. That that's really really good. And you know, losing him a couple of those games back was really tough for us. But having him back is uh, certainly shows up in, in statistically because he's a really good player. Break time on the coordinator's corner. Now, when we come back, we'll have more with defensive coordinator and defensive line coach Elisa Tuiaki. Stay with us here on the coordinator's corner. Son, my father gave this to me when I made the team, and. Now it's yours. Oh, no, Dad. I'm not on the team. I just got this at the store. We're so excited. We just bought front row tickets for all of your games. What? They were expensive, but anything to support our boy. Support me in what? I'm not on the team. You should know. We paid for the tickets with your college fund. Well, since you're on athletic scholarship now. Gear so legit, they'll think you're on the team. BYU Store. Adams. I'm Brian Adams. We created Dwight in Shining Armor. We're the writers and showrunners. What it means is, if the show sucks, it's our fault. <laughs> it's a fish out of water story, both for Greta and for Dwight. She's lost in his world, and he's lost in hers. And so, between odd couple and a double fish out of water, we have a lot we can do lot to generate trade. fun. We have two kids, and a couple of magical times where all four of us get excited about the show, and we can say, like, guys, hurry up and do your homework, and we can all, you know, get out the TV trays and watch whatever show. (laughs) That's been a really fun kind of family bonding experience for us, and we hope this show will be that for, for lots of families. Our intention was that there would be a little something for everybody. When you sit down yeah. and watch it, it should be fun. You should be having a good time. Envy. Watch BYU Sports Nation on BYU TV and BYU Radio apps. I didn't think that would go public. Radio. Talk about good. The Coordinator's Corner brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys, BYU defensive coordinator and defensive line coach Elisa Tuiaki with us in the final half hour of our final show of the Cougar football season. This Saturday night is BYU at Utah. Cougars 6-5, and five, Utah 8-3 and three, and headed to the Pac-12 championship game for the first time. Coach Tuiaki, like Coach Sitake, Coach Roderick, Coach Clark, maybe I'm missing somebody, are all former Utah coaches or staffers. How much of the dynamic of this rivalry game have you seen change since you've been a part of it? Oh, that's a that's a good question. <laughs> you know, as as a coach, for me, I'm just you kind of go in your room and game plan, come out and coach them, and and uh, you know, the color of the jersey changes, but it's really just the same game. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it's been. Uh, I, I think there was a lot of bitterness earlier. Um, you know, when we were at Utah. Um, since since there's a lot of um, you know. Um, familiarity just with coaches on the other side. I think it's a good rivalry right now. It's it's still uh, you know still still want to get after it and still want to kill each other. But but uh, you know some of the bitterness that exists before the game is isn't uh, isn't as evident. It's not it's not there. I think just because of the respect that uh, Kalani and Kyle have for each other. Um, you know it, back in the islands when you know back in the Civil War days when they would fight, um, you, you'd come to the middle. Before the before the game, and you'd uh, before the before the war, and you'd uh, try to convince your family member, hey, this is a waste of time. You should go home, <laughs> you know. And both of them knowing full well after they they split back up, you're gonna come back in the middle and kill each other. And whoever's still alive at the end of it, you know, it's. But uh, I, I feel like this is this is kind of that deal, you know. You come to come together and it's all good, and we talk and and uh, smiles and shake hand and you know, some 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 verbal. Uh, 
<laughs> battling going on. You guys are playing so well. I mean, you guys are a good team. And then you come back over, but we have every intention to go get over on the other side and kill every single one of them. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, I think that that's what the feel is right now. It's, uh, it's you know they're they're our brothers, but we're gonna we're gonna get after it when it's time. How much of the relationship, and you alluded to it a little bit, how much of the relationship between the two head coaches right now kind of colors how everything is kind of portrayed right now and perceived? Yeah, it's you know their their uh, their their respect for each other and just the, the long relationship that they've had, um, you know, coaching together and Kalani obviously on the other side being part of some of the wins uh, on that side and and really um, when we came here, um, I think it was two thousand and. 12 was it I, I can't remember the last time that, that we came here when, when Gualani and I were both coaching there some of the Utah players went to the middle of the field to you know to basically step on the wire or, you know post a flag whatever and Gualani ran out there and stopped him I think it was a little bit of respect for just the program but also he played here right and, and it meant a lot to him just for the rivalry to be real and uh, for it to be intense but not to be disrespectful like that and I think that exists right now between them didn't mean he didn't want to win the game that night he just wanted to have his guys behave yeah. a certain way yeah absolutely yeah. And, you know we 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 were on that side of the ball obviously and we won and but um, and it was important for him to to have that rivalry to come across and play hard but to still have respect for the opponent I hit this with coach lamb uh, and it's kind of something that's pretty common out there knowledge that of the last 20 games these two teams have played 17 have been decided by seven points or fewer. That means more often than not, no matter how teams are playing coming in, it's going to be a grinder to the end. That's a that's a pretty interesting thing about this rivalry. Yeah, that's how close it's been over years. Absolutely, I think that's uh, that sounds just about right. <laughs> you know, it's no matter what's going on and and who's doing what, and obviously they're they're excited going to a Pac-12 championship. I'm excited for them, and you know, I know a lot of the coaches obviously and some of the players, but uh, we're coming to knock them off, and they know that, and it's uh, it'll it'll be a good game. Yeah, that's an interesting component, too. Uh, they finished their Pac-12 season, but they've got another big Pac-12 game coming up after your game. What do you think the effect is, if any, of of, of this having this Saturday's game where it is for them? Yeah, I, th- I think that they're a well-coached team, and, and uh, Coach Witt's you know, season has been around for a long time, and obviously he hadn't been to a Pac-12 championship game yet, but uh, this, this uh, rivalry, um, being, you know, as, lo- as long as it's been, and, and him being, coaching as long as he has he'll have them ready you know they're not they're not going to be looking past um you know the, the, the kids some of them not knowing might but he'll he'll have them ready he'll have them reeled in letting them know because you can imagine those guys going to pack 12 championship game haven't lost to us they kyle knows and kyle knows and he's a smart guy and he's going to have them ready and we're going to expect them we're going to expect their best shot um, and we're going to give them our best, and, and uh, it'll, it will, we'll all go down swinging. It'll be a fun game. How much of what Utah is doing uh, is, is a model for BYU, since both you and Kalani spent so much time there, uh, particularly in the, in the trenches? What, is, what, of their, what they're doing is a model for you? Uh, you know, a um, lot, lot, of, lot of similarity as far as the background, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I consider myself as far as just um, defensive line, schematics and and uh technique and really a uh a pupil i guess of uh of pete jenkins and you know pete uh pete was really a guy that was introduced by introduced to us by uh um dave aranda when dave aranda was together with with uh, with gary at wisconsin i was able to go over and meet with them and and uh but you know Gary being being at Wisconsin, I have a little bit of influence with Dave with Dave Aranda as well as Pete Jenkins and myself going over and kind of learning the ropes that way. Um, when I was moved to defensive line the first year, um, met with Kyle first. You know, Kyle coached the defensive line. Then I met with, uh, um, yeah, name slips me, uh, former coordinator there that was coaching the D line. I can't, I can't remember the name. I can totally see his face. I apologize. <laughs> but, you know, just the, it's they've always been good up front, right? And one of the common things is recruiting in-state kids and recruiting LDS kids. I think that's been a huge part of both both programs. And, um, you know, when you're doing that, when you, when you believe in the state of Utah and believe in what they can produce as well as believing in mission kids and developing them, you're going to have big, big physical D linemen. And uh, I think that's been the case in both. Even before I got to BYU, that's kind of what they've been doing, obviously. And, and it's what uh, Utah has been doing. And um, back when Mac was still there, he was about recruiting in-state kids and poly kids from the islands and m- mission kids. And that I think has been different uh, in this state than it has in any other conference. You know, mm. some of the Pac-12 teams are starting to do it, but not, uh, they don't carry as many missionaries as, as we do. How much, uh, how close is your defensive line to looking like the way you want it to be moving forward. Long-term. Really, really close. A lot of that is just really um, 
getting the, getting the kids that look the part. You know, you've got to have big kids in order to play big. And sometimes you have smaller kids that uh, that are good players in high school. They get to this level, and and every single offensive lineman is huge, and they get swallowed up when they're small. And so it's just about standards, really. Um, you know, obviously they they know the standard, and it's about getting the kids that are that are big, long arms, physical kids that you can develop. You know, one of the really good defensive tackles they recently had was one that Galani recruited that came in. He was 6'4", 205. Who's this? Uh, Filippo Morfisi. Uh, you know, and a year after he redshirted, he was grew an inch. I think he was like 6'5", and he was 275, I think, after you say, that. You say 205 when he first came in? Yeah. To, yeah. to, to, to 275. Yeah, right. Okay, and, yeah. But not too many not, not too many coaches can see that that type of projection. Hmm. Um, you know, and it's the there's a lot of coaches that talk to us on the road, you know, when I was at Utah as, as well as here. It's like, how do you get all these boys? And it's, it's hard to convince them to take a kid that's 6'4", 6'5", 200 and tell them, just wait. You know, this kid's going to hit his poly jeans and and uh, he's going to eat cardboard and gain 50 pounds. It's just it's just the way that it works. It's just, the you know, the body changes a lot of them don't see it, but over here in the state of Utah, obviously, um, you know, there, Utah State, here, Weber State, SEU for that matter, too, is um, getting kids that are in-state kids, mission kids that that uh, gain weight and just, you know, get, get to where they need to be. But for us, it's just about projecting just because uh, they'll always, if they have the height, we can put the weight on and get them stronger. Okay, heading into our final break on the Coordinator's Corner, final break of the season. When we return, your social media questions for Coach Elisa Tuiaki using hashtag CCBYU. As we continue live on BYU TV, BYU Radio, and ESPN 960, back right after this. When my grandfather started this company in 1947, he couldn't have envisioned what we would ultimately become. We realized that our value to our customers is that we will be there day after day, year after year, doing whatever we need to to find solutions to the challenges that they face. We are committed to be honestly better in all that we do, in every opportunity that we have to serve our customers. anything up in years. <laughs> I'm singing any song. It's like... deep on BYU TV. Watch BYU take on Rice live this Wednesday at 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain on BYU TV. Watch all of your favorite BYU teams on BYU TV, your home for Cougar sports. Bruh, I got no chill. The BYU TV sports post game, BYU at Utah, Saturday after the game on BYU TV. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody. From burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality and a lot of it in Lehigh. American Fork, Provo, South Jordan coming soon to Harriman. BYU defensive coordinator, defensive line coach, Elisa Tuiaki with us in our final segment of our final show of the season. BYU's final regular season game coming up Saturday night at Rice Eccles Stadium where BYU last won on Beck to Harleen back in 2006. Now coach we know it's your last regular season game but not your last game. BYU is now bowl eligible after Saturday's home win over New Mexico State. Congrats on that and uh, and how, how, how much of a mission accomplished sense was just getting to that point? It's a huge accomplishment you know for these kids for these players um, you know for us to not go go bowling last year was was a huge disappointment um, and uh, you know these kids wanted it so badly as well as the coaches and it's really really exciting for us to get back to a bowl bowl possibilities uh, yet to be ironed out uh, 
looks like BYU will go somewhere, and I think ESPN will help BYU go somewhere, but we don't know exactly where uh, yet, and it's really not a concern until you get through Saturday night. Uh, it's good to be bowl eligible, but it's not about Game 13 right now. It's about Game 12. Yeah, this this next one up is is huge for us. It's huge for the fans. And, you know, we've t- we've talked these last uh, two years that we've been here. That's it's important for us to get this one back. And um, you know, obviously, there's nothing's changed with that. We're, we're we we need to get this win back for us and the program and for the kids. So, uh, looking ahead to Utah, uh, you you've already clearly gotten a, lo- a look at them, and they look a little different than they did a few weeks ago because of a backup quarterback and a backup running back. But that said, those guys have played well, and uh, the team itself clearly playing well. They've gotten to 8-3. Uh, they're Pac-12 South champs. Uh, some thoughts on Utah, Coach? They're a good team, good offensive team. They do a really good job. Um, you know, just I, th- I think uh, the, the first the f- game number two and game number three is where, you know, we were talking off air about uh, – how they they didn't look as good on offense, and I thought that uh, Northern Illinois as well as Washington did a good job defending them. But they've changed since then, and it seems like they they're a little bit more committed to the run. And when they're running the ball effectively, it's hard to stop them. It's a, everything else opens up for them, and really good job with their trick plays as well as just their deep shots. Um, and so we've got to stop the run first of all, and we've got to limit uh, limit their their big plays, limit their shots that they they end up taking. And uh, I think that we'll be we'll be in a good spot. We do that. You thought you'd be prepping for Tyler Huntley. You're now getting ready for Jason Shelley. Biggest differences between those two? Same difference. <laughs> <laughs> Both good, phenomenal athletes. Um, do a really good job running the offense. I think. I think you know they're they're really really similar. You know Huntley's a little bit better of a thrower, but but uh, there's there's a reason why he's a backup. I think he's he's a good player and runs the offense. And they don't really have to go away from a lot of stuff that they do with the quarterback run game and. And, uh, you know, stopping him from running as well as throwing is still going to be difficult. And from Zach Moss to Armand Shine at running back. I, th- I think Moss is a special player. I think he's a really, really good player. I think Shine's a good player. I think Moss is a special player. And so, you know, th- they're both they're both good players. They both do a really good job in their system. Um, but uh, Zach Moss got really low center gravity, does a really good job getting downhill and hitting things. And, and uh, you know, this, this back is a good player. But I think uh, what separates the two is just um, – you know, number two has just got really good low center gravity, runs runs hard, does a good job hitting it downhill. Social media now for Coach uh, Tuiaki from uh, at G Hansen 25. Uh, for Coach Tuiaki, what is the plan for Saturday to get pressure on Utah's quarterback? <laughs> You're not going to give the game plan, but uh, in terms of generally speaking, uh, how important will it be to make sure that the, the QB can't be too comfortable there uh, from start to finish? Yeah, that's... Uh... You know, we we've talked about that several times, just the, about pressure and and uh, you know, what's the definition of pressure? Mm. You know, it's it's sometimes quarterbacks. You know, so for instance, Boise's quarterback, right? You never would have thought. I I never would have thought in a million years that that uh, rushing three and dropping eight was going to be something he struggled against. You know, to to me, I would fear a good, accurate quarterback just shredding that that apart. He struggled against it, you know, and um, you have to see that the quarterback against UMass was a little bit different. Um, you know, you're afraid of him shredding it apart and him um, getting their little receiver number five, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the open field. And we ended up pressuring him about 70, 80 percent of the time, and it, and it ended up being good. It just, it just really depends on on uh, what we're what we're feeling to the game as far as we need to heat this guy up. Do we need to just drop back and just you know, because some quarterbacks have a clock in – every quarterback has a clock in their head, right? It's like drop back, I don't see anything, I'm getting kind of nervous, and eventually somebody's going to pop through and some of them take off. Some of them take off, some of them sit there and, and pick you apart. So it really just kind of depends on, on how we're feeling the game and what we feel is going to be the best thing, making them earn it, making sure that we're not giving giving anything away. The last thing that I want to do is, is – uh, feel like we need a blitz then all of a sudden we're just getting shred apart in the blitz i think it's just game to game and how we're feeling good luck saturday night coach appreciate it thanks for the season as well that'll do it for the coordinator's corner for the 2018 byu football season back with you next year from the byu broadcasting building thanks to producer jason shepherd michael minor everyone from byu tv who made the show possible and from byu radio sean o'neill terry south sean fay intern sterling richards and gm don shalai i'm greg grubel this has been the coordinator's corner we'll talk to you next season so long and go kooks my name is Terry Franz. I've been a resident of Kansas City for about 30 years. I am known as the car Santa in Kansas City. There's, there's a lot of people involved, but it's a simple process. Donate car, fix car, give car away. Then we go on the radio to tell their story and call.